Uh, and thank you for uh, getting up early. So uh, I'll hopefully uh, get you to enjoy the next 25 minutes. So a little bit about me. I'm the founder of eCrime Labs. Uh, we're working with managed and hosted MISPs because even though MISP is easy to install and maintain, some would rather just use it. Uh, I also work in incident response and threat intelligence, so that's also some of the key elements from that that uh, started this project uh, a few years ago, but uh, now it's ready for the initial release. I've been a heavy user of MISP since 15, I think I found some of the first events, so uh, yeah, a lot of things have happened uh, over these years. And uh, in my spare time, I do kayak, kayaking and uh, also a bit of swimming when, uh, when the tree trunk uh, is getting unstable. So a case, a problem and a solution. So we all know the incident life cycle, we all know the ODA loop, we all know the uh, cyber kill chain. And, and we're trying to merge all of these together when, when doing incident response, we're picking and choosing from the different areas. So, so in the first, the, the case is like building up to when going out on an incident or being a security team that get the initial alert uh, and, and how that works. So, so this is taking from DFIR reports, uh, really good blog post if anyone else is not uh, following it. So what the, what this is doing or what this is showing is that when you get the initial alert, it's never in the beginning of whatever has occurred in your environment or typically not. So uh, this alert, COBOL strike triggers in the antivirus, it triggers an alert into the SOC team, CDC team, uh, maybe the incident response team get called in to look uh, deeper into this. And then we start doing a lot of work on uh, trying to figure out what is going on. Uh, we also saw some of the CTI talks yesterday about the chaos phase. So when the firefighters uh, roll out, you don't really know what is going on. You only have the alerts, the triggers that uh, that went on, but you start to utilize your, your systems, your CM solution, and hunt for it. And during that, you will learn more about what is going on. You might get some indicators, some checksums, uh, some IP addresses, some URLs, uh, some domains that can be utilized in, in this incident and during the analysis. So this is where we start to, to utilize the, the different models of it and, and especially when, when doing the auto loop, uh, it is about trying to decide based upon the facts that you have collected. So you need to try to identify what is it that you want to do. Do we want to stay passive in our way of interacting with this incident? Do we want to just monitor it? Or if it's a ransomware or something that is starting to get towards your crown jewels, okay, you want to uh, to start being more active, deny the IP addresses, block DNS, uh, put some checksums into your AVs, EDR tools, XDR, uh, all of these things. So, so you need to make the decision and you need to act upon it. And that is like, a, we're going to say, a weight that will go on through on every incident. Because if you, <clears throat> if you have a more advanced actor, the more you learn about the actor, it also helps you to kick them out and also identify if they are more places than the place that the alert only triggered. So it is a matter of making good choices. But what is the problem then? People. So especially when you come out as an incident response team, uh, you start analyzing and then you need to start acting upon this. As long as it's in the passive part, you typically can interact with the security team on the CM solutions because you, you don't really do anything into the environment. As soon as you start to need to be able to block something, then it's actually, in some cases, a bit harder. The bigger the organizations, the harder it actually becomes sometimes. So think about this, 
how many organizations do you know that would be able to take indicators from this and push into their security system and start blogging instantly and within 15 minutes? And we need it across all the different organization environments. So we need it implemented in the DNS servers, the XDR, the EDR, uh, the firewalls, anything else that, that might be out there, VPNs. So, so starting to, uh, to block things across at a, at a certain speed. And what in the event, because that's what happens, we do make mistakes. If you add an IP address or something that shouldn't actually have been blocked, how do you get it out again? So in the typical corporate large environments, we are sometimes battling a bit with change management. I like change management, but sometimes change management doesn't like us because we want to do something fast. Again, how do you make a risk assessment? What systems can this affect if you block an IP address? Uh, all of these things. So the, the change process can sometimes be a hassle. I'm still meeting today organizations where change management think that AV updates, signature updates should be controlled by changes. That's not really how, how it works. And, and we need to help, uh, we're going to say, organizations to better understand that in some cases we just need to move along so we don't, don't just run around like uh, headless chickens uh, here when things are really going bad. So again, people, people everywhere. Uh, how, how is it that we can actually work with this because we have management <clears throat> We have uh, the security department, we have the technology, IT departments, we might have an outsourcing partner, we might even have a bunch of outsourcing partners who's responsible for what areas. Uh, and we're seeing much more of this with yeah, how the world is today. We also have cloud services and yeah, things are moving around. So there is a lot of people involved typically. And, and how can we work towards the part of, of actually removing the, the people for and, and gaining better uh, understanding for the, the incident responders or the security team in these kind of situations when you start to work upon it. So I don't know if anyone has experienced hands up how many have seen similar issues with an incident where change management or someone is starting to maybe uh, give some issues. I can see some hands, some have experienced it, yeah. And then again, the, the issue is also if you have a, a threat actor of a more advanced part, time is, is essential because it is a check game or chess game. So from the point when you make your move, they will do a counter move. So if you start to block, you better block as fast as possible across your entire environment estate uh, within a short period because else they will potentially update their code to new servers that you haven't seen. <clears throat> so, MISP to the rescue, of course. MISP can save everything. So uh, you just take MISP, integrate all the indicators into your uh, Security products, hey, problem solved. Or is it? So again, uh, I really like MISP. I like a lot of the projects that is around it. The MISP has a comprehensive API for doing things like that. But some of the, we're going to say, security issues from my perspective when getting out into an organization is that if you use the API key in, and integrate into security products, maybe at a customer or somewhere else, that key gives full access to also the context of the data. So you can make it a, a write key, so you can read and write, but you can also make it a read, but the issue is you can still see everything that is in that MISP within that organization's uh, scope of it. The second part is that if you start to implement this uh, at a larger scale at, let's say, a thousand firewalls that each pull this data, 
if you don't have it centralized in some way, the MISP will start to get resource issues because a lot of queries towards it that will create a bottleneck. Uh, so, so in some cases also with the MISP data, you have like uh, CIDRs and the firewall might only understand IP addresses. How can you work with that? And then, of course, in the event that the MISP is not publicly available or accessible by, uh, by all these systems that needs it, because again, we're working on a global scale today, everywhere. And, and again, we are security people. We don't like our MISP instance to be like available to everyone. So we like to scope it in a bit. So, so what can we do about this and still utilize the, 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 the power of the MISP? So for this, uh, Kratos is, uh, is being released today, the first one. So uh, again, uh, disclaimer, I'm another developer. So uh, when you look at the code, have that in mind, be gentle. Uh, have this as a community way to, uh, to help out. So what is Kratos? And wh why the name? So uh, whenever you make a new project, it needs to have some sort of name. And I went for the Greek mythology uh, of Kratos or Kratus or Kratos uh, with a C. So an ancient Greek personification uh, of brute strength uh, and power. Uh, kind of a demigod, but still Misp is the primary god. So in Misp we trust. So... What I did was that I utilized the Fast API uh, framework uh, to build the a REST API. Uh, I used Python and Memcache as the, the we're going to say the back end for allowing to to cache data. Uh, it also assists in the more we're going to say easy integrations into your security components because we still have a lot of security components out there that can only take a URL as input, if it even can that, if it doesn't need it to be pushed. Uh, but we also need it to be able to, the system to be able to, again, cache the data so we don't put a lot of pressure on it. Uh, so caching is essential. We need to, we're going to say, only allow the indicators out. So the way that this is built, and, and we'll get to it a, a bit later in the presentation, is that it's set up to only extract the indicators and not the context around it. So it's acting as a kind of intermediary between it. And also it supports that, let's say that you have multiple MISPs. So the CTI team has a MISP instance. The security department has a MISP. So you can use this as a proxy into these to extract data that you can then bring into your uh, various tools, and it can be firewalls, it can be XDR, EDR, CM solutions, but it can also be when you do forensic, when you need to pull some checksums of something uh, when you're out in the market uh, or out in the field. Uh, so, and again, we also work with, uh, with deduplication, because today also when you pull uh, the standard feeds that are being generated by the MISP, it's not always deduplicating data. So you can get like one IP addresses that is shown multiple times. And we also, again, I think we saw it yesterday on the, the ISAC talk uh, about, we're going to say sanity check of the data. So we also try to do some regular expressions on the data to try to ensure that when there is a field called IP, it actually contains something that looks like an IP address. So the infrastructure that can be set up with this can be as simple or advanced as you want it to be. So you can set it up simple where you actually install it on the MISP instance, or you can create a server somewhere that has access to, to your MISP instance. And I need to have a, a memcache, of course, also installed. Not public to the internet, of course. Uh, we all seen what memcache can do uh, regarding DDoS. So the more complex parts is setting up with the load balancers, uh, having multiple instances. This could potentially in the future be dockerized or something that it can be spun up or spun down as it's being used. And the same thing with the, the memcache backend. 
uh, and then it can actually interact with the uh, with the different misp instances that uh, that could be in uh, in play or whatever the the need would be. So for the security model and the structure of it, uh, it consists of we're going to say two configurations. The main one is for the the core. API means that it also has a whitelist, let's say that you need some monitoring tools that can actually query the, the API to see if, if it needs to be accessed. And then for each site, a site equals one MISP instance. It can also have a, a whitelist of what IP addresses is allowed to access this. And this is again where if you want the entire internet to, to access this, it's just zero. Uh, zero, 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 slash zero. Uh, but else you can, you can model it as, as you want. And what you do is that you create a kind of a config or an encrypted string that is being utilized to this. In the first versions, I had everything in configuration file, but the issue was how do you update this and if it's at scale. So I tried to move it into, uh, into the actual when you say security token. So it consists of like the address of the, the MISP instance, the MISP API key. Of course, this is where you also need to use the, or it's recommended to use the MISP security model. Uh, we also heard Andreas on that yesterday. That is good to IP restrict that one. So you can at least say that this, uh, we're going to say uh, MISP uh, API key is only allowed to be accessed by the Kratos uh, system. And then there are various uh, other things where the tagging, it's not easy to eat, but here we have tag eCrime Labs. That is the part where it starts to, we're going to say, map into the tagging uh, setup of, uh, of MISP. So in regards to the, the caching part, we have here, the first request where I uh, query, let's see, one year of data, and it gives me a response in, in 2.3 seconds. This was just one query. But when I queried again, because I set a caching timeout on 30 seconds, and, and this again can be modulated for every use, so you can build multiple, we're going to say, feeds based on your needs uh, and on the caching part. So then you're down to uh, around 849 milliseconds. But you're not querying the backend again. You don't, don't query the MISP instance. And that is the, the essential part of it. So the implemented requests or the implemented uh, parts currently are uh, a form to generate the token. That can also be do, done uh, programmatically. You have the documentation. You have a check page where you can just see, can it actually connect to that MISP instance? Uh, then you have statistics. Everyone loves some information on how many indicators is in this MISP instance. You have warning lists because in, in some cases, again, you don't want to update your, your data multiple places. So in this case, if you have your warning lists, uh, let's say your own IP addresses or whatever within MISP, you can actually extract that as a feed itself to other systems to say exclude these because these are on a on a good list, uh, or this is related to uh, to Google or this is related to AWS or whatever it is. And then we have, of course, a, a cleanup function in case that something is cached that shouldn't be cached. Uh, and then the, the actual feeds that is built up, like a REST API, where you choose uh, a feed type, a data type, the age of the data, and that consists of how, we're going to say, the timestamp on either the attribute itself or the, the event, whatever is updated or has the most recent uh, part of it. And then the output, do you want it in JSON, XML, text, uh, in the future, we want to support more uh, formats, and then of course the, the caching part. So, so how is the logic working? So we have different feeds, and these again is based on tags. So the incident tag you want to be able uh, both with the the incident alert and hunt tag, 
you want to be able to work on an event without having to publish it all the time. So whatever you query here goes and looks for anything that is either published or unpublished. When you start to use block, okay, now you've chosen the statement of actually blocking. Uh, it also only looks for IDS, enforced warning lists. We have the any, okay, you don't want to tag every attribute or event in your MISP system to actually utilize it. So here you can just pull the data. It still is by by the warning list, the IDS flags, and that it needs to be published. And then you have the 42 feet, which say that uh, it doesn't look at the, the warning list, so it extracts all the, the indicators. And we try to be as, as modular as possible to, to build it up. Again, there is a mapping on the, the different feeds where we have uh, IPv4 extended that is pulling like IP addresses, CDRs, uh, CIDRs, and with CIDRs, it's actually expanding those to single IP addresses, again, based on that the, the system understands it. So, simple query. Uh, the setup does support that you, if you want to move the, the authentication token uh, away from the URL, there you can put it in as a token field in itself. So again, the capabilities, when you make your choices, you can actually build your playbook, and when you're ready, you can publish it, and if it's integrated into your entire estate, the 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes time frame should actually implement this automatically. And that is the, the key point of it. Future work, uh, improved documentation, again, is just being released. It need a lot of documentation. I focused more on the, the code than, uh, than the documentation like usual, but uh, optimized code, hopefully with some help from, from you, the community. Add features to minimize data, so, so you might even uh, minimize even more what is available of the data. Uh, also at more complex output, there are some vendors that need some specific output and continuous improvement, and we should hopefully go into a stable release within a month or so. For uh, HackLU, if anyone wants to try this, let the demo gods be with me. Uh, there is actually a, a public, uh, we're going to say, a setup of this where you can try to use the API, uh, the API key there or the token, is valid uh, until end of HackLU. So, so pull it out, uh, try it, uh, give some feedback. Uh, again, be gentle. And of course, here is the GitHub repo where it's also being uh, being released. Any questions? <gasps> Questions? Any? Where? Uh. Hello. For, uh, thanks for your presentation. And it looks like a really interesting tool. Um, as uh, one of the Suricata developer, we would uh, we really like to ingest base sixty four of a domain of string. Do you have an option to encode in base64 before downloading the feed? So so uh, base64 base encoded before it's being delivered yes. that that should be quite easy to implement it's again uh, similar to with the MISP uh, project or our meeting features the use cases uh, it should definitely be uh, be possible to to give and I'll just leave this one also up there. So, awesome tool. Uh, one question regarding memcached and uh, expiration of cache. How do you do the do the expirations, and how often do you do it? So, so the good part and the way, uh, reason that I chose memcache is actually that you can set a flag on when the data expire. So, when I put in sixty seconds, that is being pushed into the memcache. And it auto expires it, so I don't need any cleanup. Of course, if the server reboots, uh, the cache is flushed. Uh, but but it's automatically 
cleaning up and that was the reason why I chose it so I didn't have to have anything in the background to uh, to expire it. Okay, great. If there's no other questions, we thank you very much. Thank you.